I'm sure that even if he doesn't use the word or he hates the word, I think the Bolsonaro is intersectional. This intersect because they are fighting for preserving intersecting privileges, intersecting dominations. Trump was very intersectional in, in its uh, white uh, nationalism. So it is not, I mean, intersectionality doesn't have uh, um, progressive politics and emancipation politics built in. It can be used by reactionary groups. It can be used by conservative groups and it is used. teach uh, about intersectionality uh, in university, I start by saying uh, that it is not a theory of identity. Um, it is uh, not a theory of multiple identities either. Uh, it is an analytics, a framework for an understanding uh, how power works in a society. So it is an, an analytic of power and uh, the way we have developed it, uh, it's not always understood this way in the literature, uh, among social scientists uh, or among activists, uh, but with Patricia, what we have developed is a kind of double framework for understanding power. Uh, so there is one category of framework that we called it uh, um, categories of power. Uh, and the categories of power is like the usual list of race, class, gender, um, indigeneity, sexuality, uh, ability, etc. It finishes with an etc. And I will perhaps come to that etc. And the second analytics is more how society is segmented, uh, like structural, and we call this framework the domain of powers framework. So the structural, for instance, the market, the, the constitution, the law, uh, laws and etc. The cultural domain of power, the representation, the ideology, symbolic and institutional disciplinary and interpersonal. Maybe it's a little bit too specific, but it is very important to understand that intersectionality as we conceive it offers us a large a view of power, not only along the categories of race, gender, class, etc., but also along the spheres, the domains of power, structural, ideological, institutional, interpersonal, even psych, I mean, embodied and psych psychological dimensions also, uh, even if it wasn't in our uh, book uh, that fifth, um, uh, level I develop in, in, in my work. Uh, so this is the way I, am, uh, I explain first, but there is something very important. Uh, it is not only for understanding how power works in a society, but it's also to intervene, to change. So there's this second dimension that we call it. It's not only an analytic, but also it's a praxis. So but this is our understanding. There are so many folks out there who do not do intersectional in this way. So we are not saying that you have to do it this way. We are not the police of intersectionality, but our understanding is, so there is this double framework. So there's an analytical richness, but at the same time, it's not only to understand, it's to uh, intervene and change towards emancipation, towards uh, social justice. Even if the word itself, intersectionality, uh, coined by Kimberly uh, Crenshaw in 1989 in an article, came from academia, she shows that she, it came from academia within the uh, working group of critical race theory, so black, black uh, uh, students, black uh, young faculty thinking about how 
law should be transformed in order to take into account multiple and intersecting discriminations. So uh, it came from the academy, but it came from the activist academy. So already in the academy, though uh, it didn't come from the um, center of the academy, from the mar mar but from the margins of the academy, those margins who were not welcomed by the center because the, uh, the center said to the margins, this is not science what you are doing. This is, you know, like a ideology. It's just two activists. So already it, it the word itself, it has activist origins. But if we look at those times when the word was not used, but the reality was used, was there and thought in, for instance, Combahee River Collective's manifesto in 1977, uh, they are talking about intersecting, uh, uh, interlocking, uh, uh, interlocking relations of power, interlocking systems of power. Uh, so um, they don't use intersectionality, but they use something very similar. And uh, Combahee River Collective, it's a black feminist, Marxist, lesbian organization. So uh, it is, it is, it clearly doesn't have academic roots. So if we uh, remind, but of course, reminding is not enough. Uh, teaching intersectionality, for instance, when I teach intersectionality, I want to teach it and I teach it in a way that pushes students to think outside of the, um, um, the walls of the university and its relevance for folks. And I ask them, you know, we need to grade, we need to ask them, you assign them a work, etc. And all the time I try to find ways of engaging them uh, in a, um, without uh, being overly scholar, uh, you know, over, I mean, we really, how can I put this? I think we need to uh, um, be coherent. If we want uh, intersectionality to keep its praxis orientation, so its social change orientation, we cannot engage it only as an analytical, trying to, uh, you know, elevate the theory and, you know, just, there is this tendency, but I think uh, the most relevant way of advancing intersectionality is through the conjoint operations of uh, theory and uh, struggles. And here I am also uh, very much um, inspired by Stuart Hall. Uh, Stuart Hall, a uh, um, Jamaican um, uh, thinker, cultural theorist, um, I mean, who did his career in uh, Britain, he always said uh, about theory uh, coming from social movements. Theory, I mean, the moment of theory, when, when a theory comes, which it doesn't come from the work of few academics just uh, discussing uh, while taking their, you know, just it is not in the ivory tower. The moment of a theory comes, and especially this kind of emancipatory theory, because, because social movements, people on the streets uh, uh, made it happen. So it is, there is something, uh, very important for us to understand that intersectionality happened not because of academics, intersectionality happened because of folks in the streets. It is a very important question, but also it brings uh, um, out uh, some uh, un some not so nice realities. Uh, the this inclusion sometimes is very um, cosmetic. It's very uh, superficial, and those who benefit most from the inclusion are again, you know, dominant groups. So there is this. It is not always done because intersection has become a very um, um, just I, I'd say. A transnational topic and a very uh, a la mode uh, in vogue etc um, 
sometimes there are quick appropriations, but not in the best interest of truly marginalized uh, people. So uh, because using intersectionality uh, or the words uh, in Canada, uh, also we are using a lot the word decolonial, decoloniality can bring, you know, you uh, can, can enhance one's chances to obtain uh, grants, to obtain money, to obtain recognition. So there is this risk of, uh, um, you know, creating departments of indigenous studies without hiring indigenous professors. There is this, there is this, uh, we will include them, but as topics, but not the real people, okay? Like, a, there will be the, uh, we will create a black studies, uh, uh, you know, yes, absolutely, uh, without hiring, or we will hire black uh, fac faculty, but not permanently, just as uh, seasonal uh, teachers, but then uh, uh, white people who are experts will be hired. So there are so much of this going on then uh, we need to really consider uh, that's why we need to be very critical of who uses our, our tools to do what. So I wish this was happy news, uh, I, I, but at the same time, on the again, uh, um, social movements level, inclusion of intersectionality also does, do not, um, does not lead always to more emancipation. Mainstream feminist movements can include intersectionality in ways that contributes again, uh, the marginalization of minority groups. So intersectionality can become an alibi, a kind of, you know, uh, an alibi to say, we are doing this good thing, we are inclusive, but does it, does it, so it cannot, it can be business as usual, just but an intersectional facade, like diversity, like uh, Sarah Ahmed would say, putting the happy faces of diversity, uh, I mean, on, on the website, but not changing the power structure of the institution. So that there is this uh, risk and we need to be uh, very attentive to who uses intersectionality to do what. I wouldn't even go there that we are ahead of you because we we do not speak. Uh, I mean, at least I don't speak uh, uh, Portuguese, um, uh, and I cannot read from their language. Uh, Carneiro, or Gonzalez, uh, etc. So it is just. Uh, uh, I. That's why there is this kind of hegemony uh, of language and the imperial knowledge structure. Uh, so I, uh, I mean, yesterday or the day before, Nawal al-Sadawi uh, deceased, the big historical materialist, uh, um, socialist, uh, Egyptian feminist. And I'm saying like, returning to her work, I'm sure that we will see elements of intersectionality in Egyptian feminist movement, again, uh, you know, because they were against uh, uh, patriarchy, but they were against capitalism and also colonialism. And, you know, so it is, I think those struggles uh, have existed uh, for a long time, they still exist, and it is uh, around the globe, as white supremacy is a global, uh, problem as capitalism is a global problem, um, as uh, patriarchy, heteropatriarchy uh, is a global oppression problem, the, the coloniality of power. And uh, so, so I think we need to speak languages and exchange just to see that uh, it is just articulated differently in different contexts and in different historical periods. But I don't think that we are uh, ahead or whatever, like it's just we have so much to learn from other contexts. 
and I, uh, I really want badly to learn a Brazilian Portuguese. You cannot know. It's just, it, it has, yeah, the more I talk, uh, and then, so, so, oh, no, 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 I have to learn this. I, I have to learn this language and read those feminists, uh, uh, Afro-Brazilian feminists from their language. It's, it would be fantastic to, to be able to do that and then enter into conversation across languages. from Turkey originally, so it's the, I, I understand so much this uh, appeal of the West and this, uh, I mean, being socialized from the, uh, from childhood. And even if it is not in our family, then it is in the, as soon as we go to the school, we are scholarized uh, uh, outside uh, the family. It's just the, like the model to, and we have to, uh, uh, you know, it's just there ahead and we have to catch them. It's always like a train or that we are running and it is, and it is uh, so uh, uh, long, it's, a, it's a such a long process to, uh, to decolonize this, uh, the mentality. And I think it's the, uh, it's the most difficult level of decolonization is, uh, this is, what has shaped us and given us a kind of identity, and uh, I, I, for me, it was uh, something of a uh, revelation when I have uh, seen the book of this guy Edward Said and Orientalism, and it was like, oh my God, there is a word for what I for this. It's like internalized Orientalism, like a West is this, we are that, and. You know, it's it's, com it's complicated and it's very painful. But I think it's uh, it is very important to for us uh, to to share those different yet uh, interconnected experiences. We uh, we are intimate in our distance. We are intimate. I mean, Turkey is so far from Brazil, but I feel such an intimate connection, especially politically, like a you know. A, populist, far-right kind of, I mean, people's, in people's struggle, I feel such a connection and intimacy with the, uh, so we need to create those intimacies. This kind of post-COVID world that, uh, but when I say post-COVID, I'm not using post as an after, but as a beyond, like, you know, like this, the post-colonial of post, like a, it, it will come with us and the afterlives of COVID will be with us. More control, uh, you know, the, the, there will be very, the technologies. I mean, university has already changed irreversibly. We will never go back to a full in-class teaching. There will always be, so, so this kind of post-COVID world, and when I, so I use post as a, like a beyond with the afterlives of COVID, I think intersectionality has, um, cannot be avoided because when we look at COVID, we see who died. When we look at the vaccine, uh, our in South Africa and India, uh, try to push rich countries, try to, so that the patent, uh, to ban the patent so that they can create their vaccines without patent to save lives and uh, to save lives in the global south in in countries who are not rich and they lost so and, and covid creates new inequality covid builds on existing inequalities but also create new inequalities such as who is vaccinated who is not it will be that's why i was saying that the etc of race gender ex, this etc is important because we are already here with a new category of domination and privilege and disadvantage, like vaccine passports. We will have vaccine passports. Those who have it, we can be able to travel. Those who don't, so, uh, um, uh, uh, so intersectionality is an, an, uh, unavoidable, but at the same time, intersectionality, I think in itself can be limited to address the issue of fascism. And 
the authoritarianism and fascism, which uh, has also been consolidated in Turkey, for instance, with the pandemic measures. Those rulers have used pandemic measures to again, like a uh, stifle dissent, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, ban protestations, uh, and they consolidated their power. So intersectionality needs to, uh, I think, uh, collaborate or like a converse with all the scholarship and activism against uh, uh, far right populism and fascism like the expertise and the, i think they we need also to develop uh, how intersectionality is used by those groups and those political parties because i'm sure that even if he doesn't use the word or he hates the word i think the bolsonaro is intersectional this intersect because they are fighting for in, preserving intersecting privileges, intersecting dominations. Uh, Trump was very intersectional in, in its uh, white uh, nationalism. They hate the world, but they rely on these kinds of uh, 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 aggregation and intersection of uh, p uh, power and privilege. So it is not. I mean, intersectionality doesn't have uh, um, progressive politics and emancipation politics built in. It can be used by reactionary groups. It can be used by conservative groups, and it is used. So we need uh, research also on that to understand, not only research, but we need collectives working on, on that research, activism to understand that it's not, we are not safe because we use this word that it's not progressive uh, by uh, magic. <laughs>